Well, good afternoon. It is Tuesday, March 31, um, end of the month, and it's the daily Facebook Live update. So actually I'm feeling um, reasonably optimistic today, which I will tell you. Um, so global cases continue to rise and cases obviously in the US continue to rise, but potentially we're seeing slight diminution in um, the speed of the rise. So we're now up to 825,000 global cases, and certainly we're gonna get well over a million um, before this is all over. There are now 41,000 confirmed deaths related to COVID. In the United States, we're up to 176,000 cases. That's up 32,000 cases from yesterday. And as of today, we have the distinguished uh, honor of having more deaths in the United States than China. So we are at 3,400, China's at 3,200. I can tell you we don't come close to Italy or Spain at this point. So the numbers continue to rise in Italy, although it definitely is slowing in Italy. So they went from 101,000 to 105,000. Uh, the number of deaths did increase, but again, the pace seems to be slowing. Um, 12,400 total deaths so far, so about four times what we have at this point. Spain went from 85,000 to 94,000. Their deaths climbed 1,000 to 8,300 from 7,300. So again, uh, the U.S. has less than half, uh, you know, uh, Spain has two plus times the number of deaths already that we do. One of the interesting things about our death rate is that the doubling time for our death rate was two days, so very short. Um, and that, you know, with um, the federal government's decision to extend kind of the, the shelter in place uh, quarantining, um, you know, the goals for COVID through the end of the month, I think that really is um, the right decision and is based really on the speed at which the number of cases um, and the deaths are doubling. Now again, I want to talk a little bit about specific areas. So again, remember the numbers, the US is 175,000 cases right now with 3,400 deaths. In the state of New York, uh, they're up to 76,000. So again, you know, more than a third um, of the cases are in New York, so still really the epicenter. The deaths in New York State have increased past 1,500. Now in New York City itself, 41,000 cases. So again, well more than half of the entire number of cases in the state of New York are in New York City. And the cases in the surrounding states, so New Jersey, Connecticut, and um, in the suburbs on Long Island are increasing rapidly as well. New York City has crossed over a thousand deaths itself. One of the states I haven't mentioned before is Florida. You may have heard earlier in talks that I'd done that I thought um, that the governor of Florida um, was remiss in him allowing spring breakers to continue to go on uninterrupted and not shutting things down. Um, he still hasn't officially uh, closed everything, but the number of cases there now is rapidly increasing. And one of the things you may have heard in the news is that a lot of New Yorkers are going to Florida. I actually spoke with a patient today who is in Florida, who's been in Florida for the whole season, um, and who is really commenting on the fact that the number of new people he's seeing in his community um, is really quite staggering. So again, the concern is that the New York epicenter is going to change quickly to the Florida epicenter, um, and we'll certainly be watching that. So the good news is, I think in our state, Governor DeWine has done a great job and our pace of rise seems to be slowing a little bit as well. So we are at 2,200 um, cases now total, up from 1,900 yesterday. Uh, our deaths increased from 39 to 55. But again, compare 55 deaths in Ohio compared to New York, which is already above 1,500, so very different. We have 585 people in the hospital right now, uh, almost 200, 198 in the ICU. So again, our numbers are increasing. Um, the good news right now is that our hospitals um, really have been emptied out because of not doing any elective surgery. Our ICUs have capacity. And so again, um, you know, when this peak hits, um, we hopefully are much better prepared than New York. And actually I wanna talk a little bit about, and I will post this on my um, social media, my LinkedIn and my um, Instagram. But today, uh, one of my colleagues at Children's uh, was nice enough to send me a link with some really interesting modeling done from, for the Institute for Health Metrics Evaluation. 
Um, and this is, um, I read a little bit about this site. So this is um, an organization that this year got $300 million to scale this from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And what they're really focused on is doing a lot of this global public health policy and doing modeling um, so that we can improve global health care. Um, on their site, which I'll put some screenshots on, and it's really interesting, you can look at data that is just US data, and then you can drill down and look at specific states. And because I've been talking talking so much about New York and then obviously Ohio, I want to give you some information about what they, um, the modeling says. So first of all, um, you know, we've all been thinking about how long are we going to need to stay quarantined um, and sheltering in place and practicing social distancing. Um, the U.S. prediction by this modeling is uh, that this pandemic will peak in the U.S. as a country on April 15th. They're able to estimate that at the peak, we will need 220,000 um, hospital beds, which means we'll have a shortage of 54,000 beds, which is hence why all of the hospital health systems, particularly in New York right now, are building um, external, you know, new hospitals uh, in certain areas. Um, and obviously we're using the naval mili the military ships as floating hospitals, and that will hopefully offset some of that shortage. The estimation is for 33,000 ICU beds, which means a shortage of 14,000 ICU beds. So again, at the peak, this really does look like a problem. Uh, ventilators, uh, the estimate now is about 30,000 needing. And from numbers that I saw previously, although they don't exactly estimate um, what kind of shortage that will be, I actually think that if we reallocated ventilators from states that are not going to have the problem that we have, that we probably do have enough ventilators. Again, it's really about about um, allocating them. They really estimate um, that will be around 100,000 total deaths and that the deaths per day will peak in the United States at 2,000 deaths per day around that April 15th number. What's really interesting is that New York, of course, as the epicenter, uh, the data looks like they're going to peak first on or early April 9th. It looks like uh, they're going to require 73,600 hospital beds, um, which means based on their capacity, they're going to be 60,000 short. So this really is an estimate of needing hospital beds in that area, right? So again, in the U.S. prediction, um, you know, it was about the same number, but again, this is, this is talking about allocating resources. They estimate 11,320 ICU beds will be needed. Uh, they really have a very limited capacity right now, which is different than the state of Ohio, and they anticipate being uh, short 10,000 ICU beds. They also estimate an additional need of 10,000 ventilators. And so again, this really is a state and a city which really struggling. And again, um, you know, we really need to um, allocate resources and move things very quickly, um, estimating that this peak is April 9th. Um, they're estimating um, at the peak there will be about a thousand deaths per day. So what's the good news for Ohio? And I think there is good news. And again, I believe that this is because our peak is later and because Governor Dwine did a really great job of instituting policies to have us stay at home and self-quarantine early. So we really are going, we really have flattened the curve um, and this is going to be helpful for us. Um, the peak is now estimated in Ohio, at least by this modeling, uh, April 20th. Um, it's estimated we will need 5,700 hospital beds and that we do have capacity and that we will not be short. It's estimating that we're going to need about 900 ICU beds. And again, it looks like we have adequate capacity, again, because the hospitals have done a good job. Um, and that we're going to need um, under 1,000 ventilators, which we have capacity for. Um, in the state of Ohio, from this modeling, it looks like about 60 deaths per day at the peak. Um, but again, I think the good news is and the take home is that um, we look to be in a better position, at least right now, than the state of New York. and what I predict Florida will end up. Um, and this really is now time for us to be very thoughtful as a country in terms of allocation of resources to the areas at um, most need. So there's been some interesting data that I thought I'd just go through with you. So there was um, an interesting study, again, that came out of the China data looking at sputum samples, nasopharyngeal swabs, and stool specimens to look at when they could still see viral particles. And you may remember that I've talked to you before that this is a, you know, there's a lot of viral shedding and it happens for longer than we wish. Um, in general, we were thinking, um, you know, 21 days at the max, but around 14 days. 
In this study, they actually found viral particles up to 39 days, so really, really long. And this is really, um, you know, again, concerning, and we certainly need more data. And this was a small study out of China looking at this, but again, um, means that probably um, asymptomatic people, both prior to getting symptoms and then after, are shedding vir virus longer than we know. Um, in a special report in the New England Journal of Medicine came out some more information about ACE inhibitors, uh, a blood pressure medication, and angiotensin receptor blockers in patients who have COVID-19. You may remember I talked a couple um, days ago about the fact uh, that there is some data and some rationale for why taking those medications might lead to a more significant uh, viral infection with COVID. Um, at least in the New England Journal of Medicine, in this article, they really um, looked at the data and really have come to um, the decision that they note that the data in humans are insufficient to support or refute, refute claims that these drugs may be harmful in such patients and suggest that there's even some data then they may be beneficial. So the take home is, and I think the American Heart Association has really said this as well, um, that at this point in time, there's no guideline to recommend stopping uh, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers uh, because of the COVID epidemic. Um, you may know that uh, on Sunday afternoon, and really we talked a little bit about this yesterday, that the FDA granted emergency use for chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine to treat patients um, uh, with COVID-19. I will tell you in looking at the website and the actual uh, written letter um, uh, authorizing this, really the guidance is still for critically ill hospitalized patients. Again, in a perfect world in the United States right now, if we had endless supply and endless capacity, um, I think even with limited data, it might be acceptable to use this in asymptomatic patients or in, you know, for patients to keep at home. But um, in this situation right now, that is not where we are. We don't have adequate supplies. We don't have robust clinical trials. And again, the FDA um, emergency authorization is really for hospitalized patients. Um, yesterday, there was a question which I didn't have much data on, uh, which is about swimming pools and hot tubs, and I did look into this a little bit. Um, definitely, uh, chlorination and uh, bromide in pools and hot tubs does kill the virus. Um, it really was talking about the fact that, um, you know, again, you can't be sure that if you have a person in a hot tub uh, sitting next to a person that doesn't, uh, and one person's infected, that you still can't shed virus. Um, but it does appear that the hot tubs really do uh, kill the virus. So um, again, that's reassuring. The good news in terms of um, testing, um, so as you remember this week, really there is a rapid uh, point of care testing um, kit that's been developed. I have no idea when that will be available commercially enough for all of us to have in our office, but that's coming. Um, they're moving quickly with having serology and antibody testing, which I really think would be very helpful, and that's coming too. Um, I want to mention one disturbing thing, and this was um, something that I talked with my husband about as well. We've been really watching the data to try to understand um, kind of the mortality in patients um, if they end up in the ICU. Um, I've seen some anecdotal reports that said that it was upwards of 80%, meaning if you are a patient who gets sick with COVID, sick enough to end up in the ICU on a ventilator, that your mortality um, was upwards of 80%. Um, there was data that came out yesterday from Seattle. Again, this was looking at just at 24 patients. Um, and the mortality of those patients was 50%, so 12 of them died, although in that study, at the time of the publication of the manuscript, three of those patients were still additionally on ventilators, so it may be higher than 50%. But again, this really just suggests that um, in those patients, uh, so again, the numbers are, it looks like about 20% 20, 20 of patients need to be hospitalized, somewhere around 9 or 10% of patients need to be in the intensive care unit, that if you are in that nine or 10% that do uh, require hospitalization in the ICU, um, that unfortunately mortality is quite high. Um, one of the things that um, has been talked about and continues to be talked about in the uh, media is whether or not there will now be um, guidance for all of us to wear masks for some period of time in the coming months whenever we're out grocery shopping or shopping. Um, you may realize from pictures that certainly in China they have been doing that and there are other countries as well where wearing masks, individuals, 
uh, us wearing masks when we go out has been implemented. Now the World Health Organization does not support this practice yet and has not stated that that's a good thing. But I think in this situation right now, uh, the US is really looking at it. Um, as I mentioned to you yesterday in my practice right now when I am seeing any patients in my staff, um, you know, we are wearing masks. And why are we wearing surgical masks? Again, this is not the N95 masks, it's regular surgical masks. That's because we want to protect you, our patients, from the chance that we may be uh, shedding virus asymptomatically. So the same thing goes true, um, you know, with kind of the concept of all of us wearing masks when we're in the grocery store and shopping in the weeks to months to come as the COVID virus, you know, we hit the peak and we start to come down um, as it's resolving, should we, as we loosen up the restrictions on social distancing, should we be wearing masks? Um, and I think that decision and recommendation um, is going to come um, out of this controversy. You know, it's controversial right now, but I think there will be guidance in the coming weeks. And I certainly know from um, listening to the uh, briefings of both state uh, governors and uh, at the federal level that this is really something that we should learn in the coming weeks. Uh, the only other thing I'll mention is um, I did see an article today that uh, Mercy Bon Secours, our health system here, which is larger than just in Cincinnati, uh, but is going to furlough about 20% of their workforce. So again, from just knowing how quickly the unemployment figures have gone up and how significantly this crisis has impacted everybody um, in every way, shape or form, um, I don't think that's any surprise, but certainly the first um, that I've seen of a very uh, deliberate uh, furlough in one of our healthcare systems. Again, we've seen that in other industries, but um, looks to me like that's the first in our healthcare systems. Okay, questions. Blood type and susceptibility or blood type and severity of infection, is there any data on that? So yes, there's a little bit of data that I talked about last week that came out and I haven't seen anything newer. Um, that looks like, again, this is from the China data that uh, blood type A, A positive, um, seems to be associated with a more significant and severe infection. Um, the problem that I don't know, because I, I haven't looked at the data in enough detail, is whether or not that's because A positive is the most common blood type. Um, but again, I think this is going to come out um, in our data, which everyone is really collecting very very robustly now in our population so that we really start to understand that. Again, what we do know is there appears to be different um, individuals who have a different response to the virus, right? So there are clearly people that have a, this very severe inflammatory response that leads to ARDS and ventilator dependence and the hypoxia uh, that we're seeing. Um, and does that correlate with blood type? I don't think we're exactly sure yet, but there's a little bit of data about a positivity. All right. And I don't, up here, what precautions should be taken when needed to take a family member to visit the eye doctor for scheduled injections? So I assume that these injections um, are important and this is not elective, obviously. So obviously someone needs to take the patient and I would do that. Um, you know, again, it's uh, trying to have social distancing when you're in the waiting room or, you know, in the healthcare facility to the best of your ability. Now, obviously that's not perfect, right? You've got to check in and register the patient. You've got to open doors to get in and out of the facility. Um, it's hand sanitizer and frequent hand washing. Um, this is a circumstance where I don't think it would be wrong to wear a regular cloth or, um, you know, regular surgical mask. Again, just to protect in case you are shedding virus from, um, you know, infecting other people. Um, but again, they're really social distancing and hand washing are the key things um, if you're entering a healthcare facility. So, what precautions should pregnant women be taking? So, um, you know, it's all the standard precautions: so social distancing and hand washing. Um, I will tell you that, you know, there's been concerns raised about pregnant women because pregnant women tend to be slightly immune suppressed to allow the fetus to grow um, in the uterus, um, that they would be more susceptible to the virus. It does not seem to be the case at this time that that's correct. Um, but again, the numbers are really, really, really small. Um, so I would, I would, if it was me, recommend that 
pregnant women treat themselves as an older person with medical conditions, um, that we would want you to be extra cautious about hand washing, social distancing, and really staying home as much as you can. I would treat you like an immune compromised patient um, and just really have you enter a healthcare facility right now, um, you know, as little as you can, go to the grocery store as little as you can, um, and again, be very fastidious about the number of people that you're coming in contact with and practice social distancing. At what point do you feel a HHA is safe to go back to work? Um, health system administrator, HHA? I don't know what HHA is. Um, you want to type it in for me? At uh, what point do you feel HHA is safe to go back to work? Again, I talked about this yesterday, um, really thinking that 21 days uh, was adequate for someone that had been um, infected. Again, I talked about data that came out from this tiny study with, in China, which looked like there was viral particles shedding for 39 days. Um, again, we don't know for sure that 39 days means that those particles are infected, but it looks longer. Um, and I am unaware of what the overarching guidance now is uh, for healthcare workers um, in terms of number of days. Um, I don't think it's as long as 39 days, and I will check into that and get back to you tomorrow. Home health aid. Oh, okay, so I'm treating that as a healthcare worker, and I would say, based on this, it's 21 days, um, and again, maybe longer. Uh, and thank you. Sorry, I'm so dumb about that. And anyone else, type your comments right now, or we're, we'll call it until tomorrow. Um, I'm hoping to have my husband on again tomorrow and give us an update about what's happening in Cincinnati um, and kind of with the um, health system locally uh, preparedness and an update on uh, local testing. So hopefully he's going to join me tomorrow and I will let you know. And if there's no questions, thanks everybody. Have a great day. Stay home, stay safe.